good evening. Um, my name's JJ Charlesworth. I'm the publisher of Art Review magazine. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, this evening uh, for this evening's discussion, which is in partnership with uh, the LSE Arts uh, Strand and Program of Public Events. Um, it's very good to see you all here. Um, quick housekeeping as usual. I'm sure you're familiar, but uh, in the unlikely event that there's some uh, great fire in this building, then uh, please uh, make your way uh, to the southwest corner of Lincoln Inn's Fields, which is apparently where you all gather when this happens. Um, this evening is, of course, also being recorded. Uh, we hope to be able to make a podcast uh, of the discussion available. Uh, please set your, mobiles, your mobile phones to silent. Uh, but of course, uh, you will be very welcome to tweet and uh, use other social media feeds to publicize and uh, propagate this event. Uh, if you want to tweet it, the hashtag hopefully is there. Hashtag LSE Museums. Um, and uh, just a quick note on the format. Uh, I'm going to uh, quickly introduce the, the, evening, the evening's discussion and then uh, have contrib short contributions from our three panelists and then open it up to a, a, a roundtable discussion, uh, which will f uh, then be followed by um, a, a Q&A for uh, hopefully about 30 minutes towards the end of the session. Um, the title of this discussion, Museums in a Global Age, asks us to consider the role and the responsibilities of our major cultural institutions today. In particular, uh, from particularly out of my interest, uh, our museums of visual contemporary art. Uh, this week is a busy week for uh, those of us who work in the visual arts. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed there's an art fair uh, about to open uh, up the road uh, in Regent's Park. Um, Freeze Art Fair will be opening its huge tent to visitors from across the world. Uh, and of course, alongside that very commercial event, museums and public and private galleries across London will be busy putting on special events, openings, uh, and so forth. Not least, of course, of course London's own Tate Modern, which, as you may know, got even bigger this summer with the extension of its new £260 million uh, extension uh, that opened in June. Uh, Tate Modern may happen to be one of the most visited museums of modern art, but Tate's success is just <coughs> one small aspect of the greater phenomenon of the expansion of museums across the world. The museum has, in the last two decades, become a key player in the cultural and social life of contemporary societies. Uh, while museums like Tate and the Guggenheim, the Pompidou and the Louvre expand to multiple locations, private patrons, by contrast, in Europe, North and South America, China and elsewhere, uh, is establish uh, uh, more and more their own public institutions to display uh, what are often private collections. Um, museums in this more global age are no longer, no longer therefore resemble their 19th century predecessors, institutions which once sought to assert the prestige of their respective national histories and cultures, often in competition with each other. Nor do our contemporary museums necessarily see their function as solely the preservation of the artifacts of the past, nor of the pure pursuit of historical knowledge. In the age of the global museum, the museum is now as much the site of contemporary artistic presentation as it is the home of a collection of historical objects. Museums have become interventionists, seeing themselves as actively engaged in the cultural, social, and economic life of the societies they inhabit. Uh, just to uh, pull on the, uh, the Tate's resources once more, uh, I think that they're on, they're on our home turf, so it's always worth giving them a nod. But as the Tate, Galleries, Tate Gallery declares in its late, latest annual report, uh, and this is right up front in that rather uh, uh, sober publication of accounts, uh, it says, Tate is a champion of art and its value to society. It believes that an understanding of the visual can enrich all our lives and that artists make a special contribution to the community. Tate it therefore has the ambition to make us all aware of the significance of the visual in contemporary life and how artists help us to see and interpret the world. Uh, so obviously on, with, with such a kind of uh, uh, a, you know, ambitious statement from such an uh, established organization, we can see that museums are clearly in the business of promoting the social value of art. And it's impossible to ignore that over the last two decades at least, museums themselves have become part of a new vision of the cosmopolitan city. No major new urban development or redevelopment goes without some thought to the cachet that a major cultural institution can bring to a city or a district. 
But as museums evolve in this more global era, in which, the museums, in which museums are both more actively implicated in their local contexts and more internationally connected, it's worth asking then, what are the broader responsibilities of museums today? How should the core, what should be the core mission of cultural institutions which engage on a global stage? How should museums engage with and reflect the world they inhabit? And why, when they do, what are the limits they face? Furthermore, how can cultural institutions negotiate the demands of the very often different, very often, or the often very different societies in which they now operate, whether this is in dealing with varying political, religious, and democratic standards that exist? Now that cultural institutions are in the business of giving a platform to contemporary art and culture, do today's museums also bear a responsibility to be ethical standard bearers? And in a culture where museums are so actively involved in their cultural, social, politi and political contexts, is it no longer enough simply to hang art on the walls and call yourself a steward of art? Um, so to explore these questions, I'm very uh, happy and, uh, well, uh, overjoyed almost, to uh, <laughs> welcome a hugely qualified <laughs> panel of speakers uh, who have been uh, wanting to um, draw together in this kind of conversation for some time. Uh, on my, I'm going to introduce them uh, as they will then uh, uh, bring their introductory remarks uh, in, the, in that order. So on my right here is Richard Armstrong. Uh, who is the director of the Sol Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum and Foundation, an international constellation of museums that includes the Guggenheim Museum in New York, the Peggy Guggen Guggenheim Collection in Venice, the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao, uh, uh, that of the Bilbao effect, if anybody's that old to remember when that was a new term, uh, and the planned Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi. Uh, previously, Richard was the Henry J. Hines II director of the Carnegie Museum of Art, where he also served as chief, chief curator and curator of contemporary art from 1981 to 1992. He was a curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art, where he organized four biennials, as well as several other exhibitions. Uh, to my direct immediate left is Adrian Ellis, who is a global thought leader, although he won't thank me to... Uh, no, I won't. I specifically... I know, but I couldn't come up with... So a, describe me, but never couldn't mind. come up with an alterna <laughs> alternative, but it's, I, I don't mind it. Uh, and uh, uh, a leader in international arts and culture, whose work spans the fields of cultural strategy, policy, and economics. Adrian is a founding director of AEA Consultants, Consulting, one of the world's leading arts, culture, and entertainment consulting firms. Uh, prior, prior to founding AEA, he served as executive director to the Conrad Foundation in London, where he planned and managed the creation of the Design Museum. He's also a former LSE student. Uh, on my far left is Tiffany Jenkins, who is an academic broadcaster and columnist and author of a very uh, provocative and interesting book called Keeping Their Marbles, How Treasures of the Past Ended Up in Museums and Why They Should Stay There. Um, she's been a visiting fellow at the LSE in the Department of Law and was previously the director of the Arts and Societies Program uh, at the London-based Institute of Ideas. So um, I'd be uh, honored if uh, Richard would uh, yep. start us off. Right. Thank you, JJ. So I'm the person who represents institutions, and uh, you heard that I've worked at a few of them, and now I work at this one called Guggenheim, which began in the late 1930s, and it had from the beginning the idea, slightly uh, delusional, I suppose, that people could, the behavior of people could be changed by exposing them to abstract art. So the director of the museum convinced a very wealthy gentleman to buy hundreds and hundreds of abstract paintings, put them on the wall, and eventually put them in a building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, and therefore change people's behavior. I do think that's central to every museum's mission, but I'm not sure that abstract art is always the best way for that to happen. The other thing I wanted to say is from its inception in the late 1930s, the museum said in its charter that it could be sited at more than one location. So when Peggy Guggenheim, who was the niece of Solomon Guggenheim, died, she decided against giving her palazzo in Venice to her children, rather giving it back to her uncle's foundation. So beginning in 1979, the New York Museum had another site, which was Venice. And then subsequently you heard about the museum in Bilbao, which has proven to be successful, we think, and our hopes of making a museum in Abu Dhabi. So I think when you have pointed questions about the role of institutions, <coughs> you're supposed to direct them at me. <laughs> okay, shall we leave it there? Okay, thank you. Adrian? 
Okay. Um, so I have a if 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 you know the sights are on you as the um, institutional guy, then the sights are on me even worse. A consultant who works for these institutions, and um, over the last 25 years, I've worked on a lot of um, uh, uh, cultural institutions, museums, performing arts centres, etc., from various angles, including um, uh, planning new ones. And so I've got a sort of you know thesis that I'll try out on you, which is about what's going on, the sort of pattern, pattern recognition, if you like, which is what you get when you half close your eyes and, and look out and, and see something. So there are, there are two interesting things going on. The first is the scale of um, the scale of investment in capital infrastructure in the cultural sector, in other words, in buildings, remains enormous, sort of inexplicably enormous. We did a piece of work a couple of years ago, and we looked at just how much is being spent I over the next 15 years on um, cultural institutions. I included performing arts in that. And if you scrape off all the froth and you scrape off all the commitments you don't think are going to happen, and you just look at what's coming out of the ground, and you look at whether a firm government commitments, you're up to about 145 billion US dollars over the next 15 years. So, God, something's going on. That's a significant amount of uh, investment of, of uh, public and uh, philanthropic resources. The second thing is, it would be great to think that people were hammering on the doors of cultural institutions, and that was entirely driven by demand. But the reality is, many of these institutions, not all, but many of them have to work very, very hard to stimulate demand. And indeed, the stimulation of demand is, is you know, where, um, uh, where people like us come in, because these are driven by forces other than um, a, a match between supply and demand and people demanding, uh, demanding culture. So there's something very, very um, interesting and curious going on, particularly as when you talk to people running cultural institutions, all but a few privileged ones, most of the time is spent agonizing about the underlying operating model and balancing the books, notwithstanding all that capital uh, investment going in. So there's something interesting happening. And uh, you know, there is a simple answer, and the simple answer is globalization. Um, that is to say, what is globalization? Globalization are ideas, people and money whizzing around the world faster and faster. They're running around faster and faster because of deregulation and because of technology. They commodify cities. Cities become commodified, and cities seek to uh, redress that commodification and move themselves back to brands. Why? Because they want to attract inward investment, they want to attract knowledge workers, they want to attract uh, cultural tourists who spend money, etc. And so the game begins. In order to differentiate themselves, public safety matters, then after that, um, transport matters and education matters, but very quickly, uh, culture matters in some form. And as culture matters in some form, so they begin to think about not necessarily ter terribly imaginatively. They, be they begin to think about uh, uh, capital expenditure in culture, and that begins the whole momentum of um of differentiating themselves through culture. And that's really one of the principal drivers, the, differenti the use of culture to differentiate your city in order to move yourself from an from anonymous uh, commodity back into, back into some sort of d distinctive identity. What is surprising is how badly we do it. And we do it badly because of a sort of failure of collective imagination, perhaps because many, many of these situations are, are, are driven as much by fear as they are by joy, fear of, fear of, um, of anonymity and all of that implies. And so often we get another layer, if you like, of, of homogeneity. Um, of the, um, uh, th if you look at the last 300 art museums um, uh, designed, uh, over 50 of them were designed by three architects, Tadeo Ando, Chipperfield, and um, uh, Renzo Piano. Really a remarkable statistic. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and we don't necessarily think, as we think about buildings, we don't necessarily think as intelligently as we might about the programming, the audience the relationship between production and consumption, the governance structures, the relationship between tourism and the local community, all these fascinating things that you would think get stirred into the equation often get stirred in, stirred in at a relatively uh, late stage. So, so, um, so I think point one is that, you know, in some ways we live in a, in, in a golden age of the centrality of culture, but it is a dangerous and precarious um, uh, situation with certain, um, certain uh, dilemmas. One of the principal dilemmas is the non-fungible 
flexibility of funding, in other words, funding often available for capital and not for revenue. Um, what that often means is a, a set of challenges. One of the manifestations of those challenges uh, it, is the accommodation, particularly in the contemporary field, between the private sector and the public sector. Uh, that is to say, between the art market and private, uh, 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 the private art world and the public world. The private art world and the values that have bound it um, are uh, the, the, the many challenges are forced upon um, uh, institutions seeking an accommodation with, with private museums, private collectors, etc. Why? Because of force majeure, because of financial circumstance, because of that non-fungibility. So there are a lot of interesting sort of um, political and moral dilemmas, um, but I trace, personally trace a great deal of it back to an understanding of those underlying forces of globalization. Last point, if Brexit and Donald Trump and terrorism and the other various horsemen of the apocalypse that are sort of lurking around us um, um, have their way, uh, then one might see a period, a historic period of reversal of globalization. I suspect that if my argument is right, that will lead to probably one of the few drivers that leads to a rapid reversal of that boom. And therefore, we might be in, you know, in LSE, we can talk about economics, we might be in a sort of hog cycle where we are very out of kilter between supply and demand in the cultural sector. Amen. Well, I, you, I too am interested in what's going on. I, I've researched um, the arts and museums in particular for about 15 years, and in that period they've become sexier, which is nice, but they've become the focus of political, cultural, and social interest. And I'm interested in, in why that's happened and what it means for the museum. I mean, Richard started by talking about the Guggenheim in the 30s. Um, I want to start by uh, quoting from Sir Robert Peel, the Tory, the Conservative who helped set up the National Gallery in London in 1830. He justified the provision of funds for the National Gallery in a speech to Parliament, in part because of the role it would play in calming social unrest. He said, in the present times of political excitement, the exacerbation of angry and unsocial feelings might be much softened by the effects which the fine arts had ever produced on the minds of men. So the idea was that the Raphaels in the collection would soothe uh, the political unrest that was occurring in Britain around the time of the Great Reform Act. So what's different about then um, and now, when you have under a Labour government in 2003 or so, the description of museums and galleries of centres for social inclusion? My question is, I, I agree, I thought it was a terrible way to describe them. <laughs> That's fine. My question is, what's different between then and now? So museums have, certainly in the 19th century, were involved in trying to uplift people. The white chapel around the corner was very much placed in in that area, it's a very poor area, and the idea was is that it could imp it could improve them, it could help them, lift them from their everyday <laughs> dreadful lives, and give them perhaps a touch of beauty and refinement. And I think two things have happened that are really important. Uh, the first is the Raphaels that the institutions are talking that would once talk about showing are no longer kind of held at the top of the hierarchy as the best. The best that has been thought and said is no longer the best. There's no such thing. It's, it's much more relative. So that kind of cultural authority and confidence in uh, the hierarchy of art has dissipated. And you have institutions who, that are trying to be, well, I mean, the Guggenheim, the Tate, they're trying to go elsewhere to make sure they include more women artists. The Switch House has a much more deliberate policy of involving more women artists and they want to have non-Western <coughs> artists too. So you have the, that kind of canon, the very idea of the canon has been uh, much questioned, which is kind of interesting that that's happened at the same time as culture is still talked about as doing all sorts of things, because you kind of have this uh, ambivalence about what culture is at the same time it's being put to all sorts of uses, the Bill Bauer effect, centres for social inclusion. And I think with that what you've had really is the politicisation of culture. So it is no surprise to me that a new Labour government coming in in 1997, um, facing difficulties of inequality, uh, unable, unable to solve those problems, turns as many on the cultural left have done to culture, to change language, the presentation of things, uh, to perhaps improve society. So you have sort of shifts in the political sphere. I also think you've got... Um, 
a slight a, a change in the idea of the audience. So it is no longer the case that you'd have these great institutions telling the audience what they needed to see and like and enjoy. Um, it's much more the case that institutions are trying to be much more relative and responsive to their audiences. So they're much more reflective. It's more like a, rather than a come and see this great Raphael, it's a here's a mirror in which we can you can look at yourself. So I think those are the sort of three uh, major differences. My concerns with that is that I quite liked those. I quite like Raphael. I do think he's one of the best. I think there is something potentially lost when you don't hold true to the ideal of a canon, which is not to say canons cannot or do not change. I think there's something to be said for raising people out of the everyday. God knows I enjoy that. Um, and I think then there are limitations when politicians look towards culture to do a lot for them. It's not that culture doesn't have, have an effect and it's not that it doesn't improve cities and um, the countryside could do with a lot more culture. <laughs> but it's not that it doesn't have an effect, it's that it's been put to quite an um, instrumentalized effect that I don't think it can kind of fulfill. And finally, I'd make a plea for the collection. I think institutions are are kind of jettisoning collections too quickly and are too flexible about them. So for me, the object of an art museum is always the object, um, and I'd like to see that placed at the top of the pedestal again. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I guess then uh, I want to bring Richard back uh, and open, uh, uh, make a, take a little bit more time to uh, attend to this issue of, well, what is the object in the institution? What is its value? Uh, what is its lo uh, lasting value? And why should we go to all this effort to establish these, as Adrian's pointing out, relatively uh, expensive and hard, often hard to run and hard to sustain institutions um, to present a collection and also um, a more contemporary activity? I mean, at the, in your opening comments, you talked about the uh, founding purpose of the Guggenheim, and you talked about um, uh, the museum as a way of changing people's behavior, which very much, again, con connects with some of the uh, things, uh, the ideas that came out of the establishment of museums much earlier on. So I just wanted to uh, ask you, uh, uh, Richard, uh, how much that, uh, how one understands the uh, value of the work and the reason and the value of preserving the work for uh, maybe not posterity but for a pretty long time. Well, I think I'm with Tiffany. I think it should be preserved forever. There are big curatorial fads that we have to live through. I've lived through a lot of them. There are probably a few more coming. But the purpose, our purpose, I think, as a group of keepers is to make certain that people after us have the possibility of looking at something and making sense of it. We give them our knowledge, our perception. We do use the word best. I like the word best. And then they can contest that. But my advice would be obey the chronology of connoisseurship and don't make decisions based on political exclusively political values, and also recognize that the effect of art is generational. It's not tomorrow. It might not even be a month from now. It might take your entire lifetime for you to understand what it is you're looking at and why. So that probably doesn't answer the question, but with Tiffany, I'd say, I think one of the charms of the museum, even contemporary museums, should be that we can slow down. Mm. Can I just draw you a bit further on this? Because there's also, uh, you know, one is the, the model of the museum and the and the social and political purpose of the museum in the 19th century seems to still have some echo in the museum of the 20th century and the and the M museum of the modern, which is something that Guggenheim very much is. So I'm just curious to draw out a little more what um, there's always that what we what the museum. Uh, continues to be able to offer and, uh, as you say, defend. What is it about uh, the history of a particular uh, culture of art that is that is valuable? What? Where is the? I think the charm, at least the I see, is it's a, you're not obliged to buy anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a selling space. You <laughs> just go there, and if you're inquisitive, you make something of it. I know it'll be misinterpreted, but I think that's to be validated also. 
and part of the charm today is it, it can be a haven, especially in a violent society. But beyond that, it can be a place where you're not subject to consumerist urges and that you're allowed to be imaginative even if your imagination is mildly inaccurate. I mean, I really think the audience has to be anyone who's curious. I'm not, I really don't advocate educated people or wealthier or less wealthy people being the audience. I think it's just available for curious people. I want, Adrian, I want to ask you in response to this, I th I, you seem to have a, I wouldn't say a cynical, but a certainly no, a, not cynical at all. certainly a, a um, perhaps slightly pessimistic mm. take on uh, the way in which a certain dynamics may yep. have may have outstripped uh, an idea of uh, a more kind of reasoned and uh, uh, constructed and constructive notion of what the function of these institutions are, uh, is. Uh, so I, I I'd like you to respond to some of these issues, of w perhaps in terms of your own experience about where uh, issues of perhaps quality, historical uh, importance, connoisseurship, and other uh, markers of, of uh, cultural value maybe get sucked into some of the processes that you described. So I, I suspect there is a rapid and immediate consensus between the three of us about what the fundamental responsibilities of, of cultural institutions are. And they're around stewardship, first and foremost, um, i.e. looking after the mm -hmm. objects. And secondly, ensuring that those objects are understood. And thirdly, ensuring that as many people as possible can understand and enjoy them. And everything else is, not flim flam, but everything else is, you know, whether, whether, it's, um, whether it's urban regeneration or whether it's improving the motor skills of the unborn child or whatever, the, whatever these other mm -hmm. sort of instrumentalized things are that culture can do, we think that probably they are sort of, you know, secondary in one way or another. Um, so if those, if the dynamic of um, rapid gregarious expansion sort of puts those at risk, then we would say probably on balance those, that, that would not be a good thing. So, so the question is, are those put at risk by the migration of, of cultural institutions from, you know, to use a, to use a um, non-digital metaphor from the back of the newspaper to the front of the newspaper over the, you know, last 20 or 30 years, which is what in effect they have done. And what, in fact, people like us have all been responsible for because we have been so canny and diligent in, in saying, yeah, we can do that, museums can do that, museums can do that at every opportunity, partly genuinely out of enthusiasm, partly because we need the funds and therefore we will play those games in order to secure those funds. But I think that one danger may be a sort of, you know, to use a harbour mass expression, a legitimation crisis. Mm -hmm. In other words, we may, have, um, we may have pushed a little hard and therefore put at risk those fundamental, those three fundamentals. Um, um, care and stewardship. How much of the funding that we secure for these institutions through what one does all day, if one is a museum director, or you know, if not all night, which is raise funds, go into conservation and stewardship versus um, the front of house or um, uh, expansion? And I, I say that a question not so much, I have to say, for premier institutions like, uh, like the Guggenheim, which I think of as a sort of you know winner takes all situation like the Tate etc. But the, but the sheer swath of museums overall because there is a conservation crisis. Um, go to um, go and look at the, uh, the, the the conditions of stores in the um, uh, average second tier museum and compare that with the you know the new marble in the front uh, in, in, in the lobby and the the, the new um, uh, the new uh, sponsors room and you'll see an imbalance in resources that may catch us out because it's a bit like the banking crisis. If people say, if people look at institutions and say, whoa, the one thing you're supposed to do is look after our damn money, the one thing you're supposed to do is look after our objects, and you find that you've done everything else but that in all your fancy, fanciness, and that's, you know, that's a legitimation problem. I think there's a second legitimation problem, which is, you've alluded to, which is the curatorial authority and the ability to, 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 to assert curatorial authority, which you both believe in, but at the same time, uh, institutions find it difficult to do that in, the, in uh, the, their regard as dogmatic and uh, and therefore there's a much more sort of negotiated discourse between you know it's your truth basically um, uh, we have a third problem uh, and it's a very interesting one which is that public expenditure on cultural institutions is regressive 
That is to say, that the median museum visitor is of a higher tax bracket than the median taxpayer, and therefore cultural institutions are a mechanism for redistributing money from poorer people to richer people. Now that is an issue. It's compounded by uh, it can be that can be uh, further compounded by tax breaks, and particularly in the U.S., etc. But that is a basic <coughs> issue because the plebiscitary politician can say, "What the hell is going on here?" Um, uh, either this is a merit good, and by a merit good I mean something that, like education, is just of such value to society that we're going to pay for it even if it is regressive, or if it's not a merit good, the underlying legitimacy of, of the institution is sort of at risk, uh, well not sort of, unequivocally at risk, if we can't articulate very powerful arguments for, it, for its benefit. And then we've got a further legitimation crisis, if you like, or a further factor in, in, in legitimation, which is, as I alluded to in you know my introductory comments, which is the relationship between the private collector and the institution. We had two um, examples on the west coast of America over the last two, two, two weeks, um, uh, both to do with loan conditions and the relationship between loans and the enhancement of value of private collections. So this is a public, a public mechanism, if you like, for recalibrating the value of private collections, where a private, uh, where a private collector actually curated his own exhibition um, uh, in, uh, at MoCA in LA. So so, so I, I can see a whole series of issues where we sort of, you know, we thought that museums were like banks, and hey presto, unfortunately, they are. <laughs> uh, so, Tiffany, it feels like you want to... Yes, yeah, so some similar comments. For me, preservation, truth, and access, so different descriptions of the same thing in terms of the purpose of both art collections and museums. Um, I think at the heart of the problem, is a legitimation crisis in terms of the content and the role of the art gallery and the museum. I think that pri that precedes the politicization and the instrumentalization of institutions. And so you have you, you solve that by restoring the idea of authority and truth. Essentially, truth has to come first, and I think everything else will flow from it. Um, I think, in a way, what you're what you're kind of what needs to be done is that is is kind of valuing judgment and the possibility of judgment, and that's where it's that's where everything has to come from. That's basically, what I think. Uh, but Richard, given that you're the guy who has to, I mean, it's easy for these guys to kind of, you know, <coughs> have a go at some of the problems, but you have to navigate these. Uh, and make an institution that works, that is credible, that is uh, valued, uh, that is respected uh, for its choices and for its uh, uh, direction. And I wondered if you wanted to come back on some of these from the well, perspective I think of <coughs> institutional experience. In a way, I think they have a harder job because it's more intangible and they're connected to eternal values. I might be connected to a fiscal year, although I look to eternal values. Um, I might say it differently from Tiffany because I'm an American. To me, the, the crisis is, and the audience can speak to this, I hope, as well, what's relevant? I mean, it's lovely that you have all your, you know, whatever's behind glass and that your person tells me that's the best one of all of them. But if there isn't some sense of relevance or maybe accessibility, that's a hard thing to keep going. Well, it I hate this. I hate this expression. It depends what you mean by relevant. But tell, re tell me. You probably well, know better than well, I do. I w when I go to an art gallery or a museum, I want to see something that's not like in my bedroom or in my house. I want it to be, in a way, irrelevant to my everyday life. Um, because it's something exceptional, something unique, um, something different. It's from another time, yeah. and another place. So, you so want, it's not relevant. But you want relevance of imagination, then? Imagination, curiosity, achievements of human cultures past, something different. And I think there has been, um, in the in bad situations with institutions, is that ha they have tried to make it relevant to their target audience. Mm -hmm. And I think usually the same audience goes to most museums and galleries. That might be a problem to tackle, um, but it's not tackled by making things relevant to the audience, because they often speak down to them. And you, you know, there, you, there are plenty of places you can go um, besides museums, and so the museums have to know what is unique about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think relevance is a tricky word. Do you want to be surprised? 
And I, I think museums and galleries are in many ways useless. But you're on your way there no matter what. Yeah. I what if I weren't That's motivated? Exactly. So. But then, that's true. You want to get. You need to seduce people. And how do you do that? I think. By n I don't think you can do it by making it exactly relevant. You have to have something unique that they won't get elsewhere. Because otherwise, th why why wouldn't they go to Alton Towers or Disney World or something that's much you know. Sexier. So, so, sexier, immediate. So you have to be able, yes, capture people's attention. But if you talk down to them, then you, you know, they'll stay for five minutes, look at their phone, and then go somewhere much more interesting. Well, we have another advantage because many of our visitors want to come see a building. Yeah. yeah. Both in Bilbao and in New York. So that's a very good kind of bait to bring people in. In fact, if you're building a museum, I'd recommend you get a good one <laughs> physically. Because if you have a mediocre museum, it makes things much more complicated. Yes, but we've seen there, there is a danger in that, isn't there? There because can be, yeah. There is this, the Bill Bauer elsewhere, uh, the Whitney, which has opened recently in downtown-ish New York. Great building, but it is more building than content, I think. Um, it's a nice building. Does the building get you there? Yeah, it gets you there, but does it make you go back? Does it make it special? But I think it's, it's very easy to, to um, take a pop at a very kind of um, hard to pin down notion of uh, museums wanting to be relevant to the audience, to draw the, the audience in. But, you know, to my mind, a lot of what goes on in museums that has any kind of relationship to certainly contemporary art mm. isn't exactly an easy sell. Right, uh, and you know the Guggenheim when it was established was not an easy sell. It, it didn't. It didn't matter. No, but this is the point. This is the, for for me. The I want to get a bit more clarity on uh, how an institution uh, articulates uh, its mission. Uh, so that the things that are presented are not just a repetition of the experience that everybody else has. I know that it's difficult to, for people to um, uh, to get what is going on in a in a culture of even contemporary art. I, I know that it's tough for people to get what is going on in um, his, uh, in, in historical <coughs> artifacts and artworks. Um, but I think that this issue of the legitimation crisis is, is interesting because we need to somehow get down to, well, what is it that our institutions are actually declaring about themselves mm. that, that sub sustains the, 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 the level of ambition which the shape of the institution, the scale of the institution, uh, somehow requires? Well, one of the attributes of an otherwise <clears throat> impossible building, the Frank Lloyd Wright building, is it physically gives you a panorama and allows you to pass by something and then look across and see it differently. So my notion, and by the way, I was an enemy of the Guggenheim because I worked at the Whitney Museum. <laughs> my idea was to say with the curators and there, another, that's another obstacle because without them, nothing happens. Yeah. I mean, I can talk all day about how great it would be to have a blue show, but if the curator doesn't want to do it, it doesn't happen. But let's go back to that building. So it's got the, because of the way it's built, you can imagine that you're ascending or descending through a historical cycle, literally. So to me, what looked good at that place would be trying to do slice of history <coughs> exhibitions mm -hmm. using art. So we thought about Gutai, this important movement in Japan after World War II. We thought about Zero, this important movement in Belgium, Netherlands, Germany after World War II. We thought about Alberto Buri trying to make something after World War II. We became very obsessed with World War II over the last six years. And part of that was to say, how can the creative people resurrect a society that's been crushed? And I think we've done that, and I hope we're going to move away from World War II now. <laughs> but we also took other chances in a way. We asked Maurizio Catalan to put everything they'd ever made, and we hung that from the center of the museum. And then preceding me, they'd made an arrangement with James Terrell, the artist, to make the museum into in a sort of light experience. So there are many ways it has to happen, but I really think in our case in particular, that reintroducing a sense of history, because your generation, I find, is somewhat ahistorical. 
which I hope will provoke questions later, <laughs> um, is enriching not only for people who might have lived through that period, but also more importantly from those who've only heard about it, or in the case of Gutai or Buri, had never even heard of it. Trustees said to me about Gutai, and I wasn't far behind them, by the way, who is that? They thought it was a person. You know, this great Japanese movement. And Alberto Buri, who had been very, very ideologically and aesthetically dominant at a certain moment and had a retrospective at the Guggenheim 40 years ago, was largely unknown to people as well. So I, we've taken it upon ourselves to be historical, um, reinterpretive, to try and reimagine, as I said before, how life can go on after the apocalypse, and then on a regular basis invite a single artist to try and reform the building and make it the way he or she wants to. So there'll be others of that coming up. Um, I also want to draw out some of Adrian's um, points or criticisms actually about uh, around this, this theme of legitimation crisis because again these are the things I mean I, I find myself often faced with uh, the news stories certainly coming out of, of the US about the compromises that are made by uh, museums with regards to the, uh, their patrons with regards to the relationship of the, the, the validation of works by their entry into uh, the exhibitions of museums, right? That, to put it bluntly, uh, collectors machinate or at least are strategic about uh, making, trying to get works that are part of, parts of their private collections into public institutions or institutions that have a public role and profile in order to uh, maximize the, uh, the, the market value. That's become a very instrumental form of, uh, of behavior. Now, I wonder if uh, that also s that actually points to something which I think is important, which is the blurring of the dividing line between what is, say, a contemporary presentation or present a presentation of contemporary activity and uh, some notion of a historical um, past which is somehow uh, distant to, or at least arm's length, to our current moment. Because what you've been describing, Richard, about um, the uh, about essentially telling stories, telling a history again in a way which is about not forgetting, or at least remembering uh, things uh, once over again, uh, clearly sets out an agenda for the social value of history making. Uh, which, but which is at the same time, you're, you know, your institution is not a, uh, purely about historical presentation. So, but I think every big museum recognizes its impact on market, mm. and in the end, there's really almost nothing you can do about that. And we have the repeated uh, experience of not being able to collect what we've presented because the prices have become so unrealistic. We want to buy a Christopher Wool after we make a giant show, but a picture costs $9 million. For us, that's five years of purchases, you know. So, so in a way, we've, we're victims of our own success. But how do you feel about a circumstance in which you've got an acquisitions committee of, of board members, say, and a curator takes them on a visit to studios, and um, they see some work that the curator has advised them is great, and they say, great, one for you, one for me? I think that's wonderful. So the result of that is that the curator... And I'm available. <laughs> so, so in a sense, it's self-inflicted of what you're saying. No, I'm saying that patronage is trickier than it might once have been. The market is ferociously healthier than it might once have been. And our capital is the way it was back then. Mm. So if you want to be a figure inside culture, because we think we have the attribute of not trading that person's work. We're not asking, we, we're not going to flip the picture Maybe four months are. from now. And they might. That's really the or one they out. may just hold it, but they, they're holding value that has, that has uh, been sort of co-curated co and co-created. Co Let's be also clear about a lot of collectors. They're really not sinister people. Right. They're actually uh, absolutely. praiseworthy people. Um, just on that again, um, 
clearly, I mean, if, if we were to take a kind of, a, again, pessimistic or pragmatic view of what happens in those situations, uh, we still have to, we still come up against the fact that by being included in the institution, something happens, right? So something about value happens. Right? Now, I understand that the, there is always a market value issue, that market value for artworks goes up. And this is very much, you know, th and the, the actual reality is that this happens with forgotten historical uh, movements or artworks from undervalued, as they say in the art market, historical artists and figures, just as much as it happens to uh, works which are uh, relatively contemporary or are part of a contemporary production. So, but what's interesting out of that is that very often the discussion never really gets to, the, to grips with, well, what is the magic touch? And what is its meaning? What is the significance? And this comes back to, I think, the, the, the value of the curator. Uh, what is the, it shows that there is still some uh, particular agency at stake in having a museum. Because, uh, Richard, the other thing is we don't really need museums of contemporary art in the sense that there are plenty of commercial art galleries doing it plenty. Right. If you're in the know, if you're, oh, you're okay, you're from you know Kansas City or Birmingham or somewhere. You've never heard of an art gallery, but you know that you can go to a museum and see right. evidence of your time. That's valuable, I think. No pun intended. No, no, no. I think there's a trust. I do think there is public trust mm -hmm. in galleries, and there are a lot of commercial galleries that are, you, you know, you have to. You have to find them. They're there. They're, you can ring the bell, and they're very easy to get to. But it's not the same as going to the Guggenheim and thinking, I will trust the Guggenheim to tell me what's interesting at the moment. I think, in a way, sometimes the public are more trusting of the, the authority of the institution than sometimes those within it and the critics of it. Well, I think Adrian has a salient point in that there's such expansion of real estate, and there's been a huge expansion of supply but there may not have been a huge expansion of discernment. And, and isn't, yeah. isn't it true that museums, because of the, the highly resonant and attractive nature of the contemporary, not the modern, but the contemporary, yeah. um, where you know, history will judge how good the eye was, you know, in some way it will sift, that, that public museums are much, much more interested in the highly contemporary than they have been historically. And therefore, that sort of, that territory of, of both taste making and taste judging has, has become a much more important part of the uh, of the museum world because there is no institution from the Met onwards that isn't just gagging to move into that highly contemporary area well, these we'll, days. I think we'll hear from the audience, but that's what society is asking for. But there we have the problem. I mean, the British Museum has Sorry. tried to get in on contemporary art. The British Museum has so many amazing things. Elgin marbles, obviously, the Assyrian sculptures, Ramesses from Egypt. It... It's done a very good job in the last 10 years of repositioning itself and being a fantastic and relevant institution without dumbing down completely. But I think it's kind of the chasing of, of contemporary art demeans it, really. Um, and I think in a way it's because they, they, there's a problem with not valuing the older stuff mm. and making the judgments about the older stuff that the kind of sexiness of, of the contemporary um, they run towards. And you know you don't have to give. You know this. You work for an institu a cultural institution. If you don't give people what they want and give them something they didn't know they wanted, then then you're winning. If you give them what they think they want, then you know it doesn't but work. On the other hand, you have to live on people's gifts. Absolutely. And yeah. they don't always give when you give them what they don't want, even though they may not no, know, know what it is. I know. I'm not sure it's your not equation. Easy. But. The relationship with the public is not an easy thing. Yeah. But uh, you chase, you know, you chase, you chase people, and they don't necessarily want you. Isn't this partly the? I mean, I know this is an old argument, but it may also be a true argument. Haven't uh, haven't we sort of moved? in that chase into the blockbuster world yeah. uh, in which we are in which institutions are critically dependent on the buzz and footfall of of the large temporary exhibition with the finite period um, and in a sense um, we, we by we are probably impertinent to say we but the sector has somehow um, uh, bred a sort of uh, bred an appetite that now sort of holds us hostage mm. 
Well, we're not able to show very much of the collection, so we're subject to that whirlwind of mm -hmm. information over and over, yeah. But, but beyond, do you have a perspective beyond the Guggenheim on that? Yeah, I'd say in a weird way, New York has gone the other direction. The shows aren't as good, and they cost less too. There's just more of them. So we don't have the depth we might have had 30 years ago, but there's more <laughs> evidence of something, which is it doesn't go very deeply. Yeah. In terms of um, the pressure to expand, and this is obviously something relevant to the Guggenheim, but it's, it's, it's a broad, you know, it's, it's in the fabric of this uh, situation everywhere. Um, the complaint has, has always echoed that um, we just don't have enough space to show what we've got. Now, that's been going on since you know, my living memory. Uh, it goes back to the Tate's own kind of uh, confusion or, or difficulty, struggle to work out how it can uh, serve the public. Um, but uh, this, this business of, I mean, how many museums do you, do you need, Richard? To, to show everything, and if we were able to show everything that we, if 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 we were able to show everything that we possess and do it properly, um, would that be a, a great thing? No, right? I think it'd be a dereliction of curatorial judgment. I mean, particularly museums, but. You're not going just to see what everything that they have. You're going to see the, ch the selection, the choice, uh, to have an in-depth look at a few pieces. And I think the kind of the kind of demand to put everything on show is a dereliction of responsibility. It's very it, compelling, though, when you're trying to raise money. <laughs> but I think the earlier answer might be, JJ, if you live in Los Angeles, you need a museum on every corner. <laughs> and it sounds like a flippant answer, but it might be the model that's coming along in our country. Okay. Uh, Many of them owned by a single person. Can I, can I just go back a little bit to the issue of the contemporary? Because I think that's, that for me is something which I really, I find we struggle with at, at Art Review. Uh, it's something that there's a lot of uh, th kind of critical and theoretical debate about when on earth the contemporary actually started, right? So, so once upon a time there was classical art and then came along modern art and we apparently were, lived in a period of modernism uh, and we talked about modern art. And at some point in the early 70s maybe something happened and people started, but later than that, but around that time we started thinking in terms of this thing called contemporary art. And it does strike me that um, museums have somehow um, lurched in response towards uh, something which we can't quite put our fingers on. What is this uh, uh, quality of the contemporary that needs to be represented? It seems to be that it boils down to institutions produce a kind of experience which is right now, which is to do with things which are either uh, current or past, but it doesn't seem to really matter. For as long as it's hap it feels that it's happening, that there is an experience involved, that's the contemporary. Right, so the, 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 obsession, the strange obsession with contemporary art and the notion of the contemporary seems to have, uh, have kind of uh, crept into all kinds of aspects of how we uh, think about culture and manage, uh, understand our, uh, our institutions of culture, uh, that uh, we seem to be struggling to make the case for taking a step back. Is that or is even periodize, I suppose. Yeah. If you think, if it's been since the 70s, so that's what, it's quite a long time now. Um, well, that's that's what I'm, I'm having this kind of strange argument with people, where I'm kind of years. teasing them into thinking, well, the, the contemporary's over, folks. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's it's 40 years old already. <laughs> you know. Contemporary. Yeah. <laughs> most most art movements are over in the, but it you know, might come the quarter back of the that, time. That that the the. the the reluctance to discern and make judgments between those different, the different works in that period, and the desire to to, to always be in the now, which is ve which is very now, isn't it? When you say that's very now, that's, I know. that's, that's terrible. That's uh, okay. Yeah. It's like <laughs> no, I know. But Adrian. So, I, I, in a sense, one of the dilemmas that many cultural institutions have got themselves into is that. Um, they can't take risks. Mm. And the reason they can't take risks is that by taking a risk, you end up betting the house 
So you either uh, become conservative, and I'll explain mm -hmm. what I mean by conservative, mm -hmm. or you take risks which have enormous, um, you know, long repercussions for you because um, you don't have basically the balance sheet, the capital, the working capital to manage those risks. If you, it's a bit like filmmakers. You know, if you're a, if you're an indie filmmaker, you make one film, you're probably going to go pot. If you've got enough money to make six films, one of them's going to make you know make back for the other ones that broke even and lost money. So you need to be adequate capitalized as we've expanded basically the expansion what the expansion of, of the cultural sector means is changing the ratio of fixed cost to variable cost what that means is changing the, the ratio of buildings to programs and art and that's what we've done structurally throughout the sector by expanding so so we have sort of often and it, it, that may be one of the causes of the quality of exhibitions to which you're alluding we are you know um, we are absorbing more in overhead and therefore less able to take risk or innovate and therefore um, uh, you know giving the public what they want and in this case maybe what they want is the buzz of the contemporary rather than having the confidence and the ability to try and sort of move taste along and educate taste seems to me to be one of the sort of downsides of of um, expansion which is not wholly funded it's partially funded but it's not wholly funded and um, uh, and it's exactly the same in the performing arts, where you know, basically, uh, larger performing arts. We, we've seen this throughout America and, and in the UK with the you know the large performing arts centre that ends up with with extremely banal programming because they cannot afford not to have banal programming because they don't have the ability to take the risk. So so maybe our expansion is a form of failure of collective imagination because there are all sorts of dimensions in which you can expand. You can expand programmatically. You can expand in terms of outreach. You can expand in terms of how you collect, but how do we tend to expand? We tend to expand in physical kit. And that just seems to me that, that we've become a little one-dimensional in our strategic thinking about ways of ways of expanding. Because what expanding really is about is about an attempt to more fully realize, more perfectly realize the mission of your organization. And, uh, and so there's got to be a relationship between mission fulfillment and building, because if not, then why are we doing it? Um, just before I, we kind of go into Q&A, I do want to bring up, um, uh, bring Richard in again on this because, you know, the Guggenheim is very much at the forefront of expanding uh, into new uh, uh, museum uh, buildings, spaces, programs. There, you have had uh, setbacks. It has not always been easy. It is not always easy. Um, and I just want to, uh, bef before we become too uh, downbeat about the, 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 the limitations and the difficulties that, we've, that, that seem to come out of the dynamic for expansion, I want to hear a bit more about how you still aspire to uh, expansion for positive and good reasons. Right. Because right? Right? otherwise, why are we doing it? Well, I inherited a commitment to the United Arab Emirates to make a big museum in Abu Dhabi, and we mean for that to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, we have a project with our friends in Helsinki to make a Guggenheim there, and that hasn't happened yet either. Otherwise, we just try to make Bilbao become uh, more centered and deeper, and its attendance, by the way, now exceeds Manhattan's. So more people are going to a city of one million and to that museum than to the museum on Fifth Avenue. In Venice, our whole idea has been to make it as complete a view of an eccentric collector as possible. And we've now it's the third most visited site in Venice. So more than 500,000 people a year are going to that very small facility. So I think in response to Adrian, we tried to deepen what we're doing inside the mission. We also, at the same moment, were attempting to build some buildings here and there. There are two ways of doing it. I hear about this from my friends in New York every month. You can, and sometimes my friends in London, who are fewer, you can go out and buy great examples of Chinese, African, South American art and bring them back to your city, and then you say to the audience, come to me and look at what I've done and what we've done collectively. 
or another model might be to build buildings elsewhere, make that activity happen, and then say to the audience for whom that's a lot more proximate, come look at it that way differently at multiple sites. So we chose that other path. And as I said, it was articulated in the founding papers in 1939. It wasn't my idea. And I'm not sure which one is good, and I don't even know which one is better. Um, can I just make one, one point? I think Bill Bow is utterly remarkable. And um, you mentioned the Bill Bow effect. Mm -hmm. And many people think the Bill Bow effect is something to do with build and they will come. Two seconds on build and they will come. No one ever said it. It's not in the film. It's not in the book. <laughs> what he said was build and he will come. And he was um, Kevin Costner, who the, the, the character is called, father, who appears out of the, the field at the end, the end. So remember, you know, build and they will come is really build and one dead white male will come. <laughs> so so that, that's an important point. But Bill Bow is not about that. Bill Bow was a brilliantly conceived and holistically conceived strategy because, because the museum was the jewel in the crown. It was not the crown. There was a strategy for the city. There was a strategy for transport. There was a strategy for, for um, uh, accommodation. There was a complete strategy uh, uh, and, um, and also ongoing revenue commitment by the Basque government to the operation. So the, the idea that somehow you would magically make this thing self-sufficient was never built into it. Um, and, so, and so as people try and replicate, uh, it's always struck me, people try and replicate the Bilbao effect mm -hmm. without understanding the Bilbao effect, which, would, <laughs> which was well conceived. And it has a catchment area. If you look at, if you look at you know, an hour's flying distance within Europe to that institution, you have got millions and millions of people. So, so I mean, the, the point being that it was, it was extremely well conceived. Um, uh, I, I, and it may be that, you, that you know, those conditions have not happened elsewhere, and those conditions require a level of political underwriting and financial underwriting, which is extraordinary. Well, I, I think where they failed um, in Britain, some <coughs> prime examples, there was no collection. So two um, examples were the Centre for Popular Music in Sheffield. In Sheffield, yeah. Um, it's now a student union bar. The public, which I think is still going on in West Bromwich, heavily funded by the Arts Council, but no collection. So unless you have something to show people and you value it yourself, I mean, this may sound obvious, but it certainly has not been obvious here. In a way, there's sort of been like culture has been asked to do things, buildings have been asked to do things without any culture inside them, um, which is obviously disrespectful cu culture and also to, to the audience. But parenthetically, let me remind you, Bill Bow, 20 years and a half old, 134 objects in its collection. Yeah. It's a very small collection. Yeah. Happens to be a good collection, but it's quite small. They have access to the New York collection, which it, makes a difference, yeah. It also had first mover advantage. In other yeah. words, you know, you know, other than Sydney Opera House, which is probably the other post-war iconic building that makes the hairs on everybody's you know, neck go up, mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a period of time when a combination of material science, um, uh, CAD engineering, and um, uh, suddenly enabled uh, advances in basically in engineering material science, mm -hmm. suddenly enabled a whole generation of architects basically to do what the hell they liked within certain confines. And we are witnessing, we witnessed therefore, the opportunities for a whole series of iconic, highly expressive architecture. And of course museums are great for that because they're big voids, so they're the holy grail of gigs for, a, for an architect who wants to do that sort of thing. And that's why you know, the top of the profession gra gravitates towards that. And we went through actually a fairly excessive period. In fact, I think, hasn't, hasn't the President of China just reined us, reined, reined us all in um, on, on highly expressive kind of loopy architecture. Um, but, but, you know, Bill Bow was in a sense one of the first of yeah. that 20 years ago. And now, you know, yeah. that building is coming soon to a, to a town near you because pretty well any, any town can do that. And therefore, the jumping on the plane to go and see it, you know, the edge has come off that slightly. Let me say one thing also before we get to the questions. In Hel Helsinki, we, were, we chose and we were obliged to have an open competition for the architect. So more than 1,700 architects made plans, and it was all blind and anonymous. There was a very distinguished committee that incorporated a number of Finns, 
and they sorted through all the possibilities and came up with six finalists. And in the end, they chose one. And unlike Bilbao, it's iconic, but it's also ecological. It's wooden. It responds to a whole bunch of impulses that are in this room with a much, much younger, more, it's, I, I'd characterize it as a lot earthier than, than a CAD-assisted building. So it was strange that this thing rose up, and it really, to my mind, demonstrates a change in expectations for public architecture. Uh, I'm going to ask the uh, audience for their questions. Um, and uh, if I can see your hands uh, for questions, and I can see a roving mic, uh, what I might do is take uh, two or three questions together um, and then bring it to the panel, those to the panel. So there's a lady uh, in the middle there with the pink uh, top. Uh, if you would mind saying who you are, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you want to pick the others first? Or? Uh, I can't see any other hands, so oh, okay. there's one here, okay, one here and another here, okay, so. Okay, uh, my name's Bakul, I'm a freelance curator and creative product, uh, producer. Um, I had a question quite specifically about um, the role of museums in the global age, when uh, quite specifically with the point of building in places so people will go to them. And I think there's a lot of conversation right now about engaging um, particular regions or cities soft power and how do you, you know, it ties into globaliza globalization in the sense of the fact that uh, travel is much more open to people. Um, but for me, there's a, there's a little bit of a contradiction here in that, well, I'd be curious on your, on your opinion on this, that we're talking about opening up areas to people. We're, we're trying to bring them to make these places destinations, cultural destinations. Um, firstly, who are we really opening it up to? How often in places like Abu Dhabi and Dubai, where they are heavily investing in culture, for example, in Dubai with D3, how often does that really impact on the locals, which I think is a really important question when we look at the, the, the role that museums have in other cities like London or New York. Um, uh, who, so who is, who is it really for mm -hmm. in the end? And you also talked, so just very quickly, it's, it's an, you also talked about how it wasn't in isolation, um, Adrian, you mentioned, in, in Bilbao, it wasn't in isolation. And for me, new countries, obviously, they're not new countries, but these were nomadic civilizations until very recently. Um, is the infrastructure there? So when people get there, is it enough? Otherwise, is it really you're going to Dubai? I guess D3 is there, it's coming anyway, it's, it's a different thing. Is it enough to have these places in isolation? Or in the end, do they become sort of vanity trips for very rich cultural nomads, as it were? Okay, thank you. Um, lady here, uh, sorry, you're gonna have to, yeah, sorry, run. <laughs> and then the lady, if you can then pass it to the lady in the scarf behind you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Wendy Earl. Um, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about more, ask a little bit more about the politicisation of museums because I, that is a real source of concern to me as a non-artist, just interested in art, kind of punter. Um, and what I'm looking at is um, a kind of a not just a tyranny of relevance, but a kind of tyranny of representation. That the idea that um, art museums and, and, and museums in general have to represent uh, women, have to represent uh, communities, have to represent minorities, have to be truly representative. And what's driving that is a kind of politicization of. Um, uh, of the idea of culture as a de democ cultural democracy, where you know culture has to be democratic, and I know this is a complicated discussion, and it's, it's not not at all straightforward. Um, and I do strongly believe that everybody should have access to culture and, and should have the chance to learn about art and that kind of thing. I, I strongly believe that, but it does feel to me as if what's happening at the moment is that driven by the desire or the pressure to be representative, there is a sort of like a real um, uh, reduction in the quality of the kind of art that gets put on show or the art that gets um, exhibited or even the art that gets commissioned. Um, and 
th th I think that's a real long-term loss. So we have some fantastic collections which maybe you know are, are, are well exhibited, but I think there's a, a potential re real loss in, to the future by this obsession with representation. I was wondering if maybe um, you could comment okay. on that. Thank you. Uh, it goes to the uh, lady a few rows back there. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ines von Weitershausen. I'm a member of faculty here at LSE, so I come at this from the perspective of an international relations scholar rather than a person in the art world. But I was, as I was listening to you, I was wondering, is there not a way of bringing all these different aspects together that you were mentioning, from ac accessibility to economic um, viability, education, I thought that was an excellent point, um, obviously, uh, to the focus on the collection and what you called, you know, going to a museum in order to learn what is interesting and what is important by putting on um, uh, shows really uh, by putting on I'm, I'm going to put it I call it shows now but by putting on something that reflects what is going on in the world right now for instance something related to security something related to terrorism I believe there is room for this and I think it's a shame that this is not supposed to be an offense, but instead we see shows on shoes or underwear or a pop star. I think there is something to be said about this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll take those three then. Are there particular ones that you want to come back on? Certainly uh, there's the question of um, uh, who is it for and what is the relationship between the international and the local and the relationship between international audiences and domestic or national audiences. That seems to be uh, connected to also the question of over here about uh, relevance and <coughs> cultural identity and so on, because there seems to be a bit of a thing here about, well, uh, who do you speak to when you're speaking as a, as a, as a museum institution, uh, and how, you should, how, should, how should you address people, and on what terms uh, should you be addressing them? And I think that the, the last point is very, very much the, the flip side, which is a positive take on exhibition making being about what What's going on today, rather than things which are about stuff that happened a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, it doesn't matter. All that stuff, does it? I mean, what we need now is shows about terrorism. And uh, <laughs> no, yeah. Can I just, yeah. I also think that's why I underline the role yeah. of the collection because these are phenomena that we've seen for centuries, right. for, for millennia, really. Mm. So you know, focusing on what is happening right now would be just one perspective on it. Okay. Who, who is it for is, a, is an interesting question. In terms of Dubai, I think we have to wait and see. It's a test. It's an experiment um, in terms of the, who the audience will be. The interesting thing that really struck me during post-Brexit was how most of the media and cultural class had no idea that 17.5 million people were going to vote to leave. Not an inkling. And these are people, particularly in the cultural world, who have talked about access and outreach and audiences for like 15 to 20 years. And you do wonder, who were they listening to? Um, so my concern often with those outreach programs is that they're, they're talking to themselves at a highly selective audience. And the, the <coughs> desire to go out has not led to going out. It hasn't led to democratization. And yet, there's that drive to almost apologize and get the most excluded possible. Um, I was really struck. The abstract expressionism exhibition on at the moment at the RA is amazing. It's brilliant. But there was a, there was a cry that came very early on on social media, a complaint about the exhibition, which was, where are the women? Now, this is abstract expressionists. <laughs> you know, these were men on the whole, macho men. What well, wasn't entirely men, obviously, and there are there are, ma there are a number of women included in the exhibition. But they aren't. It is. It was. It was a bunch of blokes and pots of paint, and it's brilliant. <laughs> but you have this desire, <laughs> this demand that the RA should have included more women. The idea that you will get more people interested in this artwork if you see people that are like them at the end of the paintbrush. And I think that stems from a crisis in the idea of art and the canon. And that is actually leading to this desire to solve that problem by audience numbers and by the most excluded. And I think the paradox of that is, is that it doesn't actually work. And it can alter the whole of art history, potentially, the re rewriting uh, abstract expressionism. Because you had that exhibition on at Denver. I don't know if anybody, uh, women artists, it's quite, it's quite a, because Denver had this exhibition about women art abstract expressionists. 
some interesting things in there, but they were expanding the definition of what abstract <coughs> expressionism is to get the women in. Now, I'm a woman. Obviously, I have an interest in being properly represented and in equality, but that was rewriting art history, and it, it, I don't think it, it does us any favors. You need far more confidence in the artwork and actually in the public because often I think they're, they're talked down to. Um, you need higher expectations of both. Um. Sorry, I no, sorry. No, go on. Uh, th three, three, points, uh, three points, I think, about the, the, the question about the Middle East. The first is there are 22 um, countries in the Arab world, so you know, each country has different strategies. Even in the Gulf, you know, Sharjah's strategy in dealing with museums and their relationship with lo the local population is very different from Abu Dhabi's, different from Dubai's, different from, from outside the UAE in, in, um, in Qatar and uh, uh, Muscat. Secondly, um, uh, the the uh, Arab Spring changed everything, I believe, and uh, those countries that basically were not particularly sensitized to their local populations, whether or not they experienced the direct impact of the Arab Spring, suddenly became significantly more interested in, and I think that that has affected and in some ways sophisticated, in some ways, their response to their local community. Third, um, uh, you asked, well, you know, if you land these buildings from outer space, is that enough? And the answer is unequivocally no, and I think everybody knows that. Uh, differences in scale, differences between, you know, the, the idea of, uh, and this isn't a particularly a Middle Eastern problem, go to Dallas and look at the cultural quarter in Dallas where you've got museums and performing arts centers overscaled cheek by jowl. What's needed is the fine grain stuff in between them, what needs an integrated plan. It shouldn't be all retail, or, uh, sorry, it shouldn't be all uh, cultural. You need to, you know, uh, put residential and other things in there. In other words, and I, I I think that's generally known, but it's often, you know, comes comes uh, comes relatively late in the day. Um, on the politicization point, um, uh, I think that in a sense, you know, um, it takes leadership. In other words, uh, if you look at um, uh, if you look at I don't know, take Neil McGregor at the British Museum. Um, Neil asserted um, um, a role for the British Museum clearly, articulately, and forcefully in a way that his predecessors had, for various reasons, found difficult. As a result of which, his predecessors, particularly by the Labour government, his entire operation was seen through the metrics of the socio-demographic base of visitors. In other words, what they were doing in terms of cultural diplomacy, what they were doing in terms of scholarship, what they were doing in terms of uh, a whole range of things just dropped because the Treasury's performance indicators were basically dreamt up by, you know, I was once a civil servant, I know what it's like, he probably sat down and dreamt up these performance indicators and they became the telescope through which the institution was, was, was perceived, the wrong end of the telescope. It takes leadership to articulate purpose and you need to do it consistently, and you need to do it both rhetorically and analytically. It's not enough just to, just to uh, be rhetorical. You also need to put those KPIs, those key performance indicators in, and report out on them. In other words, you define the contract. We live in a contractualized world. We'll never go back to a world in which the relationship between the funder and the funded is one of trust. Once you've got a con, I've never seen anywhere go, I've seen, seen everything move from, I've seen things move from, from trust to contract. I've never seen things move back again from contract to trust. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what do you put in the contract? And leadership is really in part about, um, about defining what you're going to put in the contract. And I think that that can be done, and good sectoral leaders do that. Richard, do you want to um, say something please? to the first question? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't, there, no one likes to hear that we, you live in a remote area. It's only remote if you don't live there. That's not what I meant. I yeah. Put, I meant as in, ter in terms of the hierarchy of Cuba. So, in the sense that here, we have relatively, although it's growing, we don't have so much of a discrepancy between the rich and poor. I mean, remote in the sense that it can be there. I was, I was talking about more, sorry I was talking about more does it become somewhere that only when you're talking about it become a a destination and people go well, to in, see the yeah country? in our discussions with the Emirati the principal audience for them is other Emirati mm. so that's a partly partly an answer to you okay. recognize also that Dubai and Abu Dhabi's new airport will be surely be 20 percent bigger than Heathrow so there are many more people traveling through that part of the world than through the UK. 
our projection said if we could get 2% of that visitation, we'd have 3.5 million people a year in Guggenheim Abu Dhabi in the first 12 months. So we thought that was uh, an, a good <laughs> indicator. But I know probably at the bottom of what you're thinking is, can the expatriates and the worker class have access to the institution? And we mean for that to happen. And I think they mean for it to happen as well. Yeah. Um, I take one more quick round of hands uh, questions. There's a uh, lady here who's uh, hand up. Just so in the I don't know the multicolored, predominantly orange and red, uh, yellow top. Um, uh, yeah, I'm struggling. Um, one here and uh, late. Then there's the lady right at the back. No, no. Then we'll take the lady in the uh, middle here and then lady at the back. So, if uh, where's, where's the mic gone? We got it. Yeah. I think I'm still trying to think of what the actual question is. So sorry if I ramble. Um, it it comes back to uh, what you were saying about um, underrepresented audiences and women being promoted more in art galleries, museums, collections, generally in exhibitions. Um, if I take the example of the uh, United Arab, Arab Emirates Abu Dhabi Museum, presumably there is a, a positive element in bringing to that institution artworks that maybe people in that area wouldn't normally have got to see elsewhere, so say the Guggenheim collection from various different places. But also, do you not think there's value in that exhibition or those collections or those curators picking out what it is in those artworks that is still relevant to the audiences that are coming at it from all different angles. So the people in the United Arab Emirates, how do they connect with mm -hmm. um, you know, the post-war art of America and Europe? And what does it mean for them now? So it's kind of like you can have a retrospective, but you can still add to that retrospective with the relevance of the now to more audiences? That's a great question. I mean, it's a really good question, but uh, I got you off. Um, uh, and we really should fo focus on that, I think. Um, where's the next lady here up there with a the hand up? And then a uh, lady right at the top. Just to make sure that there's uh, proper representation. Are there any men <laughs> who want to uh, <laughs> ask a question? Yes, and there's one here. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Where are we? Hello. Light relief. Yeah. Hi. Oh, yeah. Um, my name's Laura Turner. I work I at Tate in the education department, and my role's really about promoting both Tate Britain and Tate Modern as venues for youth audiences. Um, a question I have that I'm kind of grappling with at the moment um, in quite a local level is, do you think larger organisations have a responsibility to support small organisations to survive in the you know climate of cu um, funding cuts and things like that? And how does that translate when you're you know, spreading your wings abroad and setting yourself in a brand new city. How do you kind of introduce yourself to maybe quite complex ecosystem of arts and cultural venues and other things going on? Thank you. Um, and w can we get that microphone up to the person right at the back in the white striped navy top? Anyway, mm, yeah. No, it's quite <laughs> colourful, but um, Thank you. whatever. Um, Jane Wright. Hunter, really, but um, <laughs> just no, uh, one thing that didn't get discussed um, it, as you were talking about putting, uh, you know, museums popping up everywhere is that there seems to be a growing understanding in neuroscience and positive psychology and so on that cultural um, institutions, cultural landmarks really make a difference to populations um, and. I was thinking about this in the context of two things. Remembering myself thinking about Bilbao as an absolute destination immediately, almost it opened, partly for the architecture, partly for the wildness of it, um, and partly for the brand, because there was a trusted brand that if it was a Guggenheim, there would be great things to see. And there wasn't that much to see in the early days, to be mm -hmm. honest. I remember quite a 
um, big spaces and not much in them, but it was a wonderful experience. And then the other thing I was thinking about is the High Line in New York, which um, if you, you could call that a piece of art and art within art, it's made an incredible difference to neighborhoods and it's an incredible draw. And you can look at that and compare it very much, I should think, to what um, museums are being asked to do. And I just wanted your comments on that. And then a final question, um, more to Adrian, because you talk about leadership. And I think the question then, who's the leaders? And what I think we're ex experiencing in the UK is government intervention with the leadership coming from the politicians and not enough fight back from the expertise. And in fact, we were told just recently not to listen to experts. And um, no. I'm wondering no. if you fear that infiltrating um, your world. Thank you. Um, OK, I was going to take three, but I'm going to take the Because we got the, the, one, the one guy <laughs> who was brave enough to uh, put his hand up. Hi, so I'm an architect, so I came from a kind of architect perspective and my main question was supposed to be about the space and what's the space for? Because you have these vast buildings that are being built and in fact I feel like you're almost building um, warehouses. Um, you might as well want to use a warehouse like um, Dia Beacon, for example, which I, when I was there I felt it really worked and it made complete sense. Um, but I was basically the only person in the entire uh, vast museum. Um, and then you create, there, there are spaces created such as Maxi in Rome, which is again a vast space with very little in. It just, it just feels like a warehouse um, and there isn't much shown in it. So th I guess that was my question. But in fact, while I was sort of thinking about that question, uh, Richard said something that I was actually quite upset about and that was um, uh, when you said that uh, there was a w work that you wanted to buy for about nine million pounds. Um, right, you said not nine million dollars, sorry. That there was some work that you exhibited and uh, of a famous artist. Yeah, Christopher Wall, yeah. Yes, and I mean, uh, th to me that at that point just clicked the question whether you have a responsibility to pr perhaps think about buying that art before it reaches that um, <laughs> value. <laughs> uh, and it goes back to... <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I'm a trustee it turns a into a place, yeah. but um, uh, yes, yeah, so um, whether there is a responsibility towards the young people, because yeah. I'm also a young person, yeah. apart from being an architect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, did, can, are you competent enough to pick up on those points yourselves? Do you want me to recap? Um, certainly there's the issue of um, um, that it's positive for works to travel internationally to become part of an international circuit of institutions. That, that's a really, I think, a really important question for me. It's like, wh what is the positive uh, dynamic that we're seeing in this? Or what is the potential for a positive dynamic culturally for works to, to uh, circulate, to exchange, to open people up to how uh, what culture is like from elsewhere? Uh, secondly, um, is it important for now nowadays for large organizations to attempt to support a different uh, eco, uh, 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 an ecosystem of smaller organizations. Uh, thirdly, I think this is probably going to be a red rag to Tiffany, the issue of uh, neuro, perhaps neuroscience's contribution to, uh, to understanding how people feel good simply because of experience and whether that hollow, for me maybe whether the question is whether it hollows out the experience in the first place or in the, in the, in the end. So maybe um, I might have to use this as a summing up, so I might go in reverse order and end up with Richard. So Tiffany, do you want to pick up on any last points? Um, <coughs> what do I think is positive? I think the appetite to know more and to see the unexpected and the greatest works of art is really positive. I think there is an appetite out there uh, for education um, that is probably not being met. Adrian talked about Neil McGregor, and he did change dramatically the way in which the British Museum was seen in, I think, illustrative ways. Um, he was both a popularizer, and he did make things relevant, but without, he made them meaningful. So he made the Assyrians meaningful to the present without 
dumbing them down. Um, his series that you may have, I'm not sure if you know, the, hundred, the Lives of 100 Objects or something, it's still one of the most downloaded radio series. And it's erudite, it's scholarly, and it's meaningful. And I think he did it without talking down to the audience. So I think the positive thing is that there is an appetite for the greatest works <laughs> and the interesting works and surprising works. Um, the negative is I think we're not really meeting that appetite and taking responsibility for lifting people out of their everyday. Is there anything else? I think oh, that's it. Good. I was going to ask you about neuroscience, but... Neuroscience? No, no, no. Well, no. okay, no, let me just say this. Okay. Very quickly. What I think there is, I think there, there is an avoidance of arguing for the useless value of culture. Useless as in it does not have an immediate use, but it is also essential to a civilised society, and it's probably why we're all here, really, is because we think there's something about it that is special. And I think there are a number of number of ways that people in the cultural sector and the political class and everybody else avoids <coughs> asserting that value without saying it does something else or we can prove it some other way. I think that's why neuroscience has become popular because you can come along and say, well, look, you're, I can show you a picture of your brain, Richard, lighting up when you see a Richard Serra or whoever it is that you like. I can show you a picture of your brain, <coughs> therefore, there's some sort of proof, there's some sort of validation. I think we have to make that validation ourselves and neuroscience isn't going to do it. Yeah. Thank you, Tiffany. Adrian. I'll be really, really short. So, so, with respect to that, the instrumental versus the end in itself, etc., sometimes we tie ourselves up in knots. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that, you know, quality of life in some form seems an unequivocal public good, <coughs> and very few people would get up and say, no, that's a bad thing. They might spend a long time defining what it is. I think most people would argue that cultural vitality is a constituent part, an important uh, constituent part of quality of life. And they would say that museums have a responsibility uh, <coughs> uh, uh, to, to ensure that that public good is somehow generated. And behind that, you get pretty quickly to a rationale for this stuff. In other words, we have for a period of time, particularly in the UK, to some extent in the States, tied ourselves up in knots in this stuff. But I, I once did a project for the William Penn Foundation in Philadelphia, and, the, and I, you know, I asked this smart alecky question, well, why do you support culture? And he looked at me and said, well, you know, I don't really think you, if, if you've got to ask that question, I'm not really sure you should be doing this job, you know. And, and what he meant was, it is a self evident public good. And the question really is, how do, how do institutions protect and promote that? In a period of time when we know private interest um, uh, it, it, uh, encroaches on every institution. I was whining earlier on about the way it encroaches into the back door of museums. But generally, museums still represent public space. Public space psychologically, public space uh, physically, and public space uh, intellectually. And that's what this game is about, which is about creating and maintaining vibrant <coughs> public space. Yeah. I'll, I'll answer the yeah. two questions they didn't answer. So. Beautifully. First is, what's my, what's our, a larger responsibility of a bigger institution to its peers or other smaller institutions? And we recently made a big collaboration with the South London Gallery where a beautiful collection whose curator is with us tonight of contemporary Latin American art was shared with an audience in London that we thought was tremendously successful. And I think it, frequently larger institutions do have that responsibility to rise up and make sure that their smaller peers have very good opportunities. But I'd say just generally, you, I think we have to say to one another about the notions of foreignness and superiority and connoisseurship, and I'll get to the space question last. The number one thing that we can do for one another in our world is recognize each other. It's the beginning of our understanding each other. And for the museum to have examples of really high creativity from a variety of culture allows us to recognize one another in a new and different way. And that's the thing that we can offer at multiple sites. I'm not going to defend contemporary architecture. You better clean that up. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think what's good is it's a great challenge for a young architect. Because for better or for worse, museums in particular, previously houses of worship and libraries, really they make concrete what the common values are of that moment. 
Thank you. Um, we have run over, and it's been a very uh, exciting and interesting discussion. So I just want to say thank you to our panelists, uh, and thank you for you to come for you to come. Thank you.